Welcome to Real Estate 411. I'm Bob Moore with Costello Realty. Today, I'm here with my good friend and co-host, Mike Shane from Village Mortgage in Milford. Bob, a pleasure. Thanks for having me again. Yeah. Two shows so far. Two shows. Two shows. Great to have you back, Mike. Glad to be here. Today, we got another great show lined up for you. If you're tired of paying rent, you're thinking of buying, you're going to be a first-time home buyer, you're in the right place today. Today, we're going to talk about first-time home buyers. The person out there looking to buy his first home, where do you start, how do you get through the maze, what type of loans are available. We're going to talk about getting pre-qualified, pre-approved, and the whole wow. process. Wow, it sounds like a lot of information, Bob. Yeah, you know, it's, it's going to be very good information. So, Bob, let's say... Right, sorry, fellas, let's, let's start from the top one more time, just, uh, you know, for the safety's sake. Okay. I thought that was perfect. It was. <laughs> no, it, wasn't. it was, but trust me, you always want to do it twice. Okay. Just, uh, just for redundancy and for safety. All right, Bob. So all the way from the top in five, four, three. Welcome to Real Estate Four One One. I'm Bob Moore with Costello Realty. Costello Realty is located at Main Street in Franklin. Today we're here with my good friend and co-host Mike Shane. From Village Mortgage in Milford. Bob, thanks for having me back again. Welcome back, it Mike. It sounds like we just did this. It feels <laughs> deja vu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got another great show lined up Absolutely for you today. Absolutely do, Bob. Absolutely. Today we're going to talk about, are you tired of paying rent? Would you like to own, get some equity? We're going to talk about first-time home buyers and what you need to do. We're going to get into the difference between pre-qualified, pre-approved, the different type of loans that are out there. I'm going to try and get you through the maze so you understand this. And there's going to be a lot involved. It in sounds it. like a lot of information. I'm, 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 uh, I'm uh, glad I brought a pen to write down some notes. Well, definitely you'll have to take okay. some notes on so this. So, Bob, well, let me start this off. Um, I'm younger than I am now, which, mm -hmm. which is pretty easy to be. And I'm thinking about uh, buying my first home. I come into your office in Franklin Costello, and you sit me down. What are you talking to me about? What are the steps? What, what is it that I need to, need to know? Well, what I do is bring you through the whole process, Mike. Uh, one of the first things I'd ask you, are you pre-qualified? And most people, they, they kind of look at you, no. You deer know, in the headlights look? Deer in the headlights look. Deer in the headlights look, okay. First question's always had. Okay. And I talk about that a little bit. And, um, you know, you're going to have to talk to a loan officer, somebody like yourself. Someone like me. Experienced loan experience, officer. Get pre-qualified. That's the first thing. We don't want to be out looking at homes for four, five hundred thousand dollars when you can only afford three hundred thousand. Sure. You know, what, how much debt do you have? Okay. We'll work all that out. I think it's important people know, you know, what they can afford, and what they can't afford, and about closing costs, down payments, and and gift because I mean, as with our industry, there's a lot of terms like PMI, mm -hmm. escrow, prepaids that I mean, we do this every day, all day, so. These are terms we're comfortable with. We're comfortable we're with. We're comfortable with. But the poor guy and his wife sitting next to me are not. May not have. So, uh, so you tell me when you want me to jump in and kind of explain some of the jargon. Well, when I first sat down, we'll say with you, with the first time buyer there, that's one of the first things. That'd be the number one topic I'd ask him about. The second thing, you know, your needs and your wants. I mean, are we looking for a two bedroom? Or are you looking for four? What are you looking for? The house on the lake, perhaps? Yeah, the house on the lake there. And with the, Bird line, fur line, bird bath out back there, and so on. But I mean, seriously, I mean, if you're just getting married, are you going to be starting a family in a couple of years? Sure. Do you really want to get a two bedroom, or should we be looking at a four? And we'll go through what they really need and what they want, would be the big things. And if they had, they were on Zillow or one of these other programs looking at a house down the street, I'd probably make the arrangements, take them out, and show it to them. After they're pre approved? Well, maybe even the first day. I okay, mean, it's very excited. nice. You know, they want to see something. They're anxious to get out there. They sure. want to you know, see what the, it looks like and so on. Next thing I'd do is I'd have them get in touch with you, Mike. And, I'd, you know, I'd send them over to you and really the ball's in your court. Now, can you explain to us what you mean by pre-qualified and pre-approved? Great terms. Ask this all the time. Here's the difference. When you're pre-qualified for a mortgage, it means you've spoken to an officer like myself You've given verbal information. You've told the loan officer how much you earn. You've told the loan officer that your credit is good, excellent, great. 
you've told the loan officer you have $20,000 in the bank or Aunt Hilda is giving you a gift of $10,000. The mm -hmm. only problem with that is it hasn't been verified. And in a competitive market like we have today, where things are coming on the market Tuesday and going off the market Wednesday mm -hmm. under agreement, right. I'm telling my borrowers, and maybe you feel the same, that you really should make the extra effort to get pre-approved. And pre-approval is really applying for a mortgage without having a property. So you provide pay stubs, W-2s, tax returns, bank statements, and also with pre-approval, we run credit. We run what's called a tri-merge bureau, um, Equifax, TransUnion, and Experian. So we look to see that you have the credit numbers to qualify for certain loans, plus we look at your debts. Here's an issue that comes up more and more. Student it, loans. You know exactly <laughs> what I was going to say. Young couple, do it, the math, right? It, it, um, it used to be true that in the mortgage world that deferred student loans don't count as debt. So when you ask someone on the pre-qual side what are your debts, they don't mention the student loan. Mm -hmm. However, when you run the Trimerge Bureau, you see they owe the University of XYZ $20,000. But people say to me, Mike, I owe them $20,000. It's in deferment. It doesn't give a monthly payment. What do I do? This comes up all the time. So I say, call your student loan servicer and ask the following question. If the loan came out of deferment today, what would the minimum payment be that I'd have to pay? And get something in writing because under some loan programs, but not all, deferred student loan debt counts as a payment, even though you're not paying mm -hmm. it. For example, on a conventional loan, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, deferred student loans, uh, deferred loans count. However, under FHA, if it's deferred for more than a year, it doesn't count. So that's why I think it's good to talk to someone who's experienced so they can suggest using this loan program because of this situation or using that loan program because of your situation. What's, what loan program fits your needs the best? Mm -hmm. But eventually they're going to have to start paying on that. Eventually they're going to have to start paying for it and that's why I think some student loans count it now because they won't anticipate that payment shock or that payment jolt once it comes out of um, uh, once it comes out of deferment. And what type of loans are out there? If I wanted to buy a house, can I still get something with no money down? Well, you can, because you're a vet. <laughs> yes. Um, I mean, there are there are some zero down loans. One, of course, is the VA loan, mm -hmm. where you can put zero down and you could have no private mortgage insurance or PMI. And if you're a veteran, if you've used it once, as long as you've sold that house, you can use it again and again and again. Mm -hmm. If you've been active duty, you can use it. Even if you've been National Guard, you can use it as well. So for the right person on the right property, VA loan is wonderful. There's also for zero down, there's a USDA loan, US Department of Agriculture loan, which is a zero down loan. The only problem with USDA loans are is they are geographic specific. For example, I live in Milford. There is no area in Milford which is USDA eligible. It's towns like Oxbridge, Douglas, more rural towns. Mm -hmm. USDA are fine, plus they have some income restrictions. You can't earn more than X dollars. However, for the right person on the right income, USDA is an excellent loan program. A lot of people think that since we had the mortgage problems of years ago, that all loans require 20% down, if they require a down payment. That's just not true. Uh, we're doing great volume with FHA loans, which is 3.5% down. It can come all gift money. And since the housing market has stabilized, the private mortgage insurance or the PMI has been cut in half. You can do a mass housing loan with 3% down, no PMI, all gift money. And there's also the conventional world of Fannie and Freddie, 
and they offer 3% down loans for first-time home buyers and for non-first-time home buyers, 5% down. So really, if you can have a gift of 3%, if you can borrow from your 401k plan, okay, mm -hmm. you may want to look at home ownership because it really is something that people can obtain. And rents are doing nothing but going up. Oh, that's true. And, you know, just backing up a little bit, you say with a VA loan, you need no money down. Yes. So when you put the offer in, you don't put any money with the offer well, and nothing at the, with the P&S when well, you sign it? Well, that's a great question. But, um, I mean, in theory, you don't have to, but certainly the seller Wants is going to gonna want something. some skin in the game. So you explain to your agent, mm -hmm. your buyer's agent, that you're going VA. VA is zero down. So you would probably have to give a thousand dollar deposit with the offer or five hundred dollars right. you'd have to give something with the purchase and sale agreement but that but that down payment with the purchase and sale agreement you would get back as a credit for your closing costs and prepays so yes i think there might be some sellers who would be concerned a bit but i think once you explain that by definition va can be zero down hopefully it'll put their mind at ease. But that is a great point. Right. Because buyers, sellers want you to have skin in the game, skin Right, being, so you just don't walk so away. So you don't just don't walk away, yeah, yes. And I think probably maybe 5% would be a yeah, good number. I would think that'd be reasonable, And you yeah. get that back at closing. You get it back at closing, you can even use it for your closing costs, if mm -hmm. need be. Or as with all loan programs, that they do allow the seller of the property to typically pay around 3% of the sale price towards mm -hmm. your closing costs in, pre in prepays just to make it easier for you to buy their house. Hmm. Well, there's a lot of options out there. For there people. are so many options out there, but I think, I think it's important for people to know that credit is still important. It used to be years ago when I make this joke, if you had a pulse, you, you got, got a mortgage, loan. you got a loan. <laughs> That's not true anymore. Right. Plus now, there are a lot of mortgage programs plus private mortgage companies where they base their rate on their mortgage on risk and risk is determined by credit score. So those who have a higher credit score can get a better rate, better rate. and lower PMI payments because statistically they're lower risks. Higher the credit score, lower the risk, lower the rate, lower the PMI factor. Mm -hmm. Can you explain a little bit more about the PMI? I think some people are confused that, you know, I had one person asking me, well, I got the, the mortgage insurance, so if I lose my job, I'm not going to lose my house. Okay. Um, Is that how it works? No, it doesn't. Um, <laughs> so. PMI stands for Private Mortgage Insurance. Mm -hmm. And what it really does, Bob, is it protects the lender in case of foreclosure. I lend as a bank to somebody $200,000, mm -hmm. and the house goes in foreclosure, and at auction, my $200,000 house has a sells for $170,000. So there's a $30,000 gap between what I'm owed on the house and what I got at the house at auction. Mm -hmm. So that $30,000 is paid by the, the private PMI. mortgage company and the PMI companies. And nicely put, gently, the PMI companies then take the sellers of that home or the mortgage holders to court to try to collect the money. Mm -hmm. But they pay me. I feel good. The PMI companies, they sue or litigate right. against the people who, who, um, who, um, who uh, had the foreclosure on the house. So basically the buyer is paying the insurance for the bank on the mortgage. Basically, yes. And yes. they're getting nothing out of it. Well, they're getting the loan. Right, they're getting the loan. Yes, but, but certainly uh, it's not happens. life insurance, it's not job insurance, it's not dental insurance. Mm -hmm. It's just insurance, as you said, to protect the lender in case of foreclosure. And if there's a gap between what they owe and what they sell it for, which there normally is, it right. protects the lender, it pays the lender, correct. Pays it off, so. Yeah. Well, that's, that's good for the lender, I not mean, so much It's for not a bad thing, right. but also years ago, the government did make PMI tax deductible, so that is one benefit. Mm -hmm. And plus, there are ways to avoid PMI. One is what's called lender paid PMI, where the lender increases the rate slightly to cover the PMI premium. The other way is to get what's called a piggyback loan, where you put down, say, 5%, you get a second mortgage for 15%, and then a first mortgage for 80%. It's called the blender or piggyback loan. All these loan programs have pros and cons. Speak to your loan professional, but, but those are two ways to avoid PMI. 
Okay, you can also get the seller to pay your PMI. You can you? get, that's a great point. Normally sellers pay closing costs and prepays, mm -hmm. as we said, but in theory that is true. You can have the seller pay your what's called lump sum so PMI at closing. That's a good right. point. Even if you paid a little bit more for the house, that you'd is be true. better off having yeah, the no, seller pay off your PMI, so it's one less bill you that have. That certainly can be done. Um, it's called single premium life of loan PMI, correct. Good point. Yeah. <laughs> You're no rookie. <laughs> well, I've been around the block once and twice. <laughs> <laughs> so now we get the buyer gets done with the O. Yes. And he comes up with a number. But again, and it, um, it does take longer to get the pay stubs and W2s. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's free, and there's no commitment to come to me for the loan, but it does help the agent know that these people make an offer that A, they'll get the mortgage, and B, as you said, maybe they're looking for homes for 250, but maybe they can go 275, just to let them know that right. they can't afford it. Or they're thinking of the 500 and they should be in the 300. Exactly. Right. I mean, no one wants to be a mm -hmm. chauffeur and drive people around if they just can't afford a home that they're looking at. Right. And there's ballpark. What's it take you? Probably three or four days to be able to get all the paperwork together and you know, say, in yes. theory, it could be done in a day. It really sometimes depends on how organized uh, the borrowers are. Mm -hmm. If they have a f nice folder with everything, it could be a day. I mean, what really helps now with mortgages is that years ago, things were faxed. We needed originals. Mm -hmm. Now with scanners, scan boom, 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 boom. Yep, it's very over. quick. And to get the credit report, a minute, 30 seconds. It's all it takes. It's now. all it takes. Now, when you pull my credit report, does my credit go down after that after keeping you know, people keep on pulling your credit reports? I mean, if, if, if you shop around to 15 different banks over a month's time, yes, it may affect it's it. It's going to flag something. It's going to flag something. But certainly, if you go to one lender and have your credit pulled, it's not going to have a negative impact. Mm -hmm. Also, the way the credit bureaus work is this. If you have a mortgage inquiry, they assume that if you're going to have one mortgage inquiry, you're going to have two or three. So they do it as you can have, I believe it's six inquiries within 10 days, and it's, all, and it's only considered one inquiry. Mm -hmm. Just because people do shop, shop around, around for Can't their best deal, yeah. as they should. Yeah, well, that's a good point. Now, once we get done there, they're back in my court. Yes. I'm and exhausted. You're, you're exhausted. <laughs> but then again, it's cost to buy you nothing. He's talked to you. You've given him a letter saying he's pre-approved. Correct. He's good for, what, 60 or 90 days now? It is good. Actually, um, the credit report is actually good for 120 days. We may ask for updated bank stubs mm -hmm. or pay stubs um, in 60 days. But 60 days, that's good for. And the credit report is good for 120 days. Okay. And I think another big point for the bias is once you have the credit report and you're good for, we'll say, 300000 Yeah. You don't want to go out and buy the brand new car. You, you don't. don't want to go out and buy something big. You don't. It, yeah. I always tell people is when you're thinking about buying a house, there are a lot of do's and don'ts, okay? Don't make large deposits undocumented from money under your mattress. Mm -hmm. Not a good idea. Don't buy the TV at Best Buy. Don't go down to Foxwoods and lay you know, and, and put down you know five thousand dollars on a number on the craps table and that's your down payment. So I say, live a very conservative, boring life. Don't co-sign a loan for anybody. And if you have a question that comes up about a large deposit or if you have to buy something, call your mortgage professional, discuss it. I mean, there are ways to just do don't these blindside. things. Just, let, just, let just don't blindside you. Just don't blindside that because. Depending on when your mortgage closes, we may run another credit bureau on you, depending on when. Mm -hmm. And if we see an inquiry, we may ask, was credit opened up from that? And if it was, how much now do you owe that? In most cases, it's not a big deal. But if you open up a new credit card with an $8,000 balance on it, and your monthly payment is $300 a month, that could, in theory, mm -hmm. affect your debt to income ratio. So again, anything you're not sure about, Always ask. Right. And probably it's not a good idea to go out and buy the $60,000 Corvette. And probably not. Probably not. <laughs> Wait till after better, you get the better house. Better to get the bicycle fixed. Right. After you, get the, after you get the house, maybe buy the Corvette. But for now, ride the bike. Right. And then again, you don't want to do anything about your job. If you were thinking of changing jobs, Wait till you get into the house, right? That is correct. You don't want to change jobs. Now, sometimes you have to. Right. Sometimes you have to. So the rule of thumb is this. 
if you change your job in a similar field, it's not an issue. Normally, we do ask for at least one pay stub on the new job. So typically, if you go from a career from computers to a career selling cars on commission, that's bad news. You'll, you, for chances are, right, you your something. loan's not going to happen. Because for commission or bonus, you need two-year history, and you're not going to have it certainly selling you know, selling mm -hmm. for her business. And all those fields have their ups and downs. That is you correct. Busy that is months, correct. But again, always else. ask the question. Right. Well, it's some very good information. And again, this costs the buyer how much? Zero. Zero. I know. I've been doing mortgages for 26 years. I, um, I teach seminars in Franklin and Milford. I really enjoy talking to first-time home buyers because they always have a question. There's a good, there's a good um, need factor as mm -hmm. well. I mean, you, I mean, you must like working with first-time home buyers as well. Oh yes, I do. You know, it can be a lot of fun, and you know, a lot of times you'll have the two kids in there, and you're explaining something to them, and, and you look at them, and you got the deer in the headlight look. You know, what are you talking about? Yep. And you know, a lot of times I'll go over things two or three times when I'm, I'll bring them out, I'll show them some houses, then we'll say, you know, the last house she didn't like it, but let's write an offer. If you're gonna write an offer. Here's what it would look like, so they see it ahead mm -hmm. of time. And I think it's a great way in doing things, because when they're ready to put the offer in, sign this, here's the contingency, here's this, here's that, and you want them to do what? You know, it's very confusing. This way they can look it over ahead of time. It's important, I think, to be comfortable doing what you're doing, and sometimes, as you said, going out, making the offer, looking at various homes, as you said, looking at, you know, wants and needs. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's a process. And, and, and I make the joke sometimes, and it's true, I always tell younger couples, when you go buy a home, maybe you should go with a bottle of aspirin sometimes. <laughs> because, I mean, it, it's a very emotional time. Right. I mean, sometimes we're counselors as well. You're going to make offers on homes. You're not going to be accepted. You're not going to be outbidded. So it's emotional time. Right, and everybody's trying to save a buck too. I mean, sure, that's asking true. asking 400, they want to put in at yep. 350, and the battle starts. So, you know, it gets to be in a very interesting time. So next, I think, big step would be in the home buying. Once they're done with you, they've been pre-approved, I have a letter because I need that letter if I'm putting in any offers. A uh, home buyer is not going to accept an offer unless it's cash from somebody and they want to see proof of funds. Sure. They want to make sure that you are qualified yep. for that home because what they don't want to do is take the house off the market, have the home inspections, moving right along, Next thing you know, 21 days later, you can't get the mortgage. So sorry. Yeah. So yeah. you've lost. Especially two in a busy market like now. Right. And you could be in prime time. Like right now is a very prime sure. time. And uh, you're, you're losing that on the house. So my next step, you know, I have your pre-approval letter. This is when we go shopping. I sit down with the buyers. And this is going to be a lot of fun. You know, what are you looking for? We've decided on the town. It's a number of bedrooms. I have it on my computer. I can also put them on a mailing list so they get in constant updates. Uh, they see a number of houses, they want to go out and take a look at them. I make the arrangements. And I'll bring them out to the house and we'll go through it. And you know, I always point out the good, the bad, the ugly. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of these kids, they're not familiar with things. You can get into some of these, we'll say an older home. The electrical's not updated. You have fuses, you have knob and tube wiring. You have a lot of problems there. And I like to point things like that out to my first time buyers. I'm not a home inspector, but you know, you might want to consider, you're going to have to update the electrical, sure. you're going to have to do this. Uh, I'd rather tell them than spend the four or $500 on a home inspector. But you know, if they still have the heart set on it, okay, we'll put the offer in. And we'll negotiate with the seller, and we'll see where it goes. There's probably going to be a lot of back and forth on it. And um, when we agree on the price, and they accept the offer. Uh, next big step is the home inspection. And this is a very big step. You don't want Uncle Joe coming out the door with that's the jack of all trades and the master of none. You want a licensed <laughs> you home do. inspector. You do. Uh, Although the relative means well, yeah. he or she may not be your best choice. And might not be up on the latest codes and different things that you need. Plus too emotional as well. Right. And you know, they just might be you know, a roofer or something else. And um, you want somebody to go through the electrical system. You want somebody up in the attic looking at the ventilation and possibly mold. The structural integrity, is it built correctly? Do you have the right uh, joists and so on? The plumbing, the heating, the, the heating system. 
uh, the way the property is laid out, uh, looking at the roof line and everything else, checking your roof. And it can be very informative, uh, but when you get done, I mean, it's probably going to cost you four or five hundred dollars, and you're going to have a full report. Okay. I have a question for you. Sure. This comes up all the time. <laughs> okay. No home inspection is perfect. No, okay. not even on a new home. Not even a new home. That's true. So, whose job is it to contact? You're the buyer's agent. Mm -hmm. So, is it is it the buyer's attorney who contacts the seller's agent? Is it you to try to negotiate either having these items fixed or some type of credit? How does that all work itself out? If there's it, if, it, kind if, of there's, some, if there's that. something not something wrong with the house, right? It depends. One, a lot of times if you're dealing with a foreclosed or a bank-owned property, it's being sold as is. Yeah, there's no one to talk to. A lot of times it's an estate sale, sold as okay. is. They're not going to do anything. Uh, one of the things that I use the insist on doing, haven't done, is the Title V. Mm -hmm. That's the private um, sewerage. You want that tested. You want that certified that it's working and it's good order. Uh, if you get into a bad system that has a bad septic system, you could be twenty, thirty thousand sure. dollars getting that fixed. You can't get a mortgage for the house. Right if now the you're in a catch system fails. You a, yep. It's a cash buyer only. Cash what only. do you do in the, in the situation where it's a it's a regular normal sale? On a normal sale, I'd probably get, be getting a call, or I'd be calling the listing agent that day. We get done with the home inspection. We'll say at noon time, and um, you know everybody wants to know how we make out. Sure. And I tell her yes, we do have some issues. Uh, they say the roof is about ready to let go, and you know, the roof should be replaced, the boiler's on its last legs, and a couple of other things. And, um, you know, is your buyer, is your seller willing to work with us? Would he give us a credit for the roof? We'll get two or three roofing companies out here, you know, get a price for the roof, and we'll take, we'll say the medium price on it. Mm -hmm. If the boiler's just about gone, um, the same thing.